Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. This episode contains references to sexual assault, though not graphically, and one instance of violence to a child. Listener discretion is strongly advised. On March 10, 1994, Susie Bocum, a 24-year-old assistant manager at Bojangles, was found dead in her Charlotte, North Carolina apartment. She had been raped and strangled with a towel. There was no sign of forced entry, which led investigators to believe Susie knew the attacker. Little did investigators know that not only was a serial killer responsible for Susie's death, she was actually his 10th victim. And while investigators scrambled to make an arrest, he would kill an 11th. I told y'all on the last episode that I hate covering serial killers. I do. It's the worst kind of cases to cover. But like last week, the victims of this serial killer were not the typically vulnerable members of society, like sex workers, who serial killers usually prey on. These young women didn't live or work on the streets. Some were college students, some young mothers, many had similar jobs, all of them had families who immediately raised the alarm. They did not disappear easily, like so many young people on the fringes of society. Obviously, I am in no way saying that the death of a sex worker or an unhoused person does not matter. What I am saying is that it is unusual for a serial killer to prey on the type of victims in this case. And that's because this serial killer was connected to almost every single victim, either as an acquaintance or friend. There is no doubt that the police should have connected these cases sooner, but they blamed the crack epidemic during the early 90s when the murder rate of Charlotte was out of control. They blamed being shorthanded, not enough detectives to handle their murder rate. But it wasn't just the police. The court system also let this serial killer slip through the cracks. There were so many places the system failed the victims of this vicious murderer. Welcome to episode 166, Rapist and Serial Killer, Henry Lewis Wallace. Charlotte, North Carolina is the most populous city in the state. Today, there are around 900,000 residents. Back in the early 90s, there were about half that. Demographically, around 39% white, 33% black, and 16% Latino or Hispanic. But as I just told you in the opening, there was a serious crack epidemic at that time, according to officials, which made the murder rate inordinately high. According to the officials, it just so happens that most of the victims of all the murders they were investigating were black. So let's get started, although we won't go in order right away. Born on July 1st, 1969, Vanessa Little Mack grew up in Mecklenburg County, North Carolina with her two brothers and three sisters. After graduating from North Mecklenburg High School, Vanessa attended Gainesville Business College. She went to work at Carolina's Medical Center in Charlotte, North Carolina, as a patient's escort, where she was known to always show concern towards her patients. In early 1994, Vanessa was a 24-year-old mother of two daughters. The older daughter lived with her paternal grandmother, Barbara. The younger lived with Vanessa in a Charlotte apartment. They all shared a close relationship. Barbara was like a mother to Vanessa. On February 20th, 1994, just after 6 a.m., Barbara went to Vanessa's to pick up the younger daughter so she could babysit. When she got to the apartment, she found the back door was ajar. This was very odd, as Vanessa always kept the door locked. Barbara peeked her head inside and called out for Vanessa, but there was only silence. She walked into the apartment and found Vanessa's four-month-old daughter lying on the couch all alone. Another sign that something was terribly wrong. Barbara made her way into Vanessa's bedroom 
and saw her feet hanging off the side of the bed. She immediately called 911 and then took the baby outside to wait for police. A Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department officer answered the call. He found Vanessa lying on the bed with a towel around her neck and blood coming from her ears, nose, and the back of her head. Her pocketbook and its contents were dumped out on the bed. An autopsy concluded that Vanessa had been strangled. Less than three weeks later, Charlotte police had another homicide to investigate. That of 18-year-old Brandy June Henderson. Born on November 21, 1975, Brandy Henderson was described as being full of life. She was friendly with everybody. She loved people. And she loved being a mother. In the spring of 1994, Brandy was studying at Central Piedmont Community College. She lived in an apartment with her boyfriend, Vernus, and their 10-month-old son, Tommy. Less than a month after Vanessa Mack's murder, on the night of March 9, 1994, Vernus returned home and found the front door unlocked. Inside, items were scattered around the living room and the stereo was missing. Vernus walked into his son Tommy's room and found him sitting on the bed, gasping for air. He had a towel wrapped around his neck and white stuff was coming out of his mouth. Vernus ran to remove the towel from his neck. That's when he noticed his girlfriend, Brandy, lying face down on the bed. He rolled Brandy over and noticed that her face was blue. She had towels wrapped around her neck as well. He removed the towels and called 911. While on the phone with the operator, he was instructed to move Brandy to the floor and perform CPR on her. But the 18-year-old mother was pronounced dead when first responders arrived. Tommy was rushed to the hospital where he was examined. He had bruising on his cheeks and eyelids, which was caused by a buildup of blood pressure due to his jugular vein being blocked. Miraculously, his vital signs were found to be stable. However, Tommy didn't pull away from being injected with a needle. The doctor who examined him later testified that he found this reaction to be strange. He said the ligature around Tommy's neck, in addition to his other injuries, had caused him great pain and suffering. Tommy had an altered mental state, which was evidenced by him not reacting to the needle. This was due to a compromise of blood flow to his brain. As more blood started flowing to Tommy's brain, he started acting more normal. Following an autopsy, the M.E. determined Brandy's cause of death to be strangulation. Charlotte police noted similarities between her murder and Vanessa Mack's murder. Both women were black, neither had signs of forced entry into their apartments, and both women had died by strangulation. Police were not yet sure about a possible serial killer, but it was worrying how similar the murders were. Then, another eerily similar murder took place, this one in the same apartment complex Brandy had been murdered in. Born on March 7, 1970, Betty Jean, known as Susie, Bochum, was described as being very sweet, with so much life ahead of her. In the spring of 1994, Susie was the assistant manager at Bojangles on Central Avenue in Charlotte. Her manager told the Charlotte Observer that Susie had a lot of good qualities, she was a very nice young lady, a hard worker, dependable, and she had just a beautiful smile. On March 9, 1994, Susie failed to show up for her shift at Bojangles. Her director called Susie's apartment multiple times, but no one picked up. The next morning, Susie failed to show up again for her shift. At this point, her director was getting worried, so he drove with another employee to Susie's apartment. They knocked on the door and looked in the windows, but everything appeared normal. The director then contacted Susie's mother and aunt and found out that they had not heard from her either. They all went to the police station and reported Susie missing. The following day, on March 10th, a Charlotte police officer received a call from a maintenance worker who found an unconscious woman in her apartment. Upon their arrival, the officer discovered Susie lying face down with a towel around her neck. An autopsy concluded that Susie died of strangulation. She had defensive wounds, 
abrasions over her left shoulder, arms, right upper chest, and abdomen, as well as blunt force injury to the head. There was a buildup of blood in her lungs, enlargement of her brain, small hemorrhages in the muscle in the front of her neck, and in the lining of her voice box. Susie's murder was very similar to Vanessa's and Brandy's. The only difference was she wasn't a mother. But she had another connection to the other women that the police soon learned. There was one common name that came up in all three investigations. Henry Lewis Wallace. Henry Lewis Wallace was born on November 4, 1965, in Barnwell, South Carolina, a small town of around 6,000 residents, about 60 miles southwest of Columbia. He and his older sister were raised by their mother, who was well-known in the small town. One newspaper reported she was a sort of blue-collar heroine. Wallace attended Barnwell High School, where he was one of the most popular students, according to the state. He served on the student council and played junior varsity football and basketball. He was also the only male cheerleader on the War Horses varsity cheerleading squad. One of his teammates told the Charlotte Observer, I remember he was very nice, considerate, well-dressed all the time. We never ever felt uncomfortable around him. We trusted him totally. During his senior year of high school, Wallace worked on and off at a radio station. In 1984, after graduating, Wallace joined the Navy. He was stationed at Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in Bremerton, Washington, where he served as a weapons technician. For a few years, things seemed to be going well for Wallace. That changed in January of 1988, when he was arrested for trying to steal a VCR television set and microwave from a hardware store in Bremerton. Wallace pled guilty to the charges and was sentenced to 38 days in jail and 24 months on parole. That same year, he left the Navy and moved back to Barnwell, South Carolina. He took a job at a radio station, working as a weekend and nighttime DJ. At first, Henry Wallace seemed to be the same great guy he'd been as a senior in high school, but his cracks quickly began to show. In 1989, the radio station asked Wallace to leave after tapes and other equipment went missing. He then started working as a chemical operator. Wallace's cracks continued to grow bigger and bigger. On March 31, 1990, he went to the home of an acquaintance, a 16-year-old girl named Viola, and invited her to go for a ride, and she accepted. After going to two nightclubs, Wallace took Viola to a motel, supposedly so they could steal a TV from the room. Once inside the motel, Wallace grabbed Viola and tried to rip her clothes off. When she resisted, he put a gun to her head and said he was going to kill her. Viola started screaming, so Wallace took her from the room and drove her home. Two days later, Viola's mother went to the police, and Wallace was charged with assault with intent to have sex with a minor female, a felony, with a maximum prison sentence of 20 years. Wallace was held in jail for more than a week. During that time, he was questioned about the murder of 18-year-old Sean Bethea whose body had been found the day before, on April 1st. Born on February 13, 1972, Tashonda Siobhan Sean Bethea grew up with her aunt and uncle in the same Barnwell neighborhood as the Wallace family. Wallace's mother worked at the same factory as Sean's mother. They were friends. In mid-March 1990, Sean, a student at Barnwell High School, was reported missing. She had last been seen with Henry Lewis Wallace. When Charlotte investigators asked Wallace if he killed Sean, he said no. They combed his car for evidence, but he had already cleaned it. There wasn't enough evidence to charge Wallace with anything in relation to Sean's murder, so they continued pursuing the assault charge stemming from the attack on Viola. But instead of going to jail, Wallace was accepted into the pre-trial intervention program, which allows first-time, non-violent offenders to avoid a trial and keep a clean record. Um, 
He held a gun to her head and tried to rip her clothes off, but this was nonviolent. That's crazy to me. A gun being held to your head is one of the most immediate threats of violence I can think of. You might escape someone hitting you, choking you, even pulling a knife on you, but most people freeze when they see a gun. Anyway, Henry was allowed to enroll in the program despite what was obviously a serious threat to an underage girl. However, he failed to complete the program, and the charges were reinstated. Wallace was ordered to attend court in January 1991. When he didn't show up, a warrant was issued for his arrest. A month later, in February 1991, Wallace was arrested on four charges of larceny and burglary after he broke into Barnwell High School and stole numerous items, including a very expensive camcorder, which he tried to sell at a pawn shop. Wallace was sentenced to serve 10 years, which was then suspended to one year of confinement and three years of probation. He was released after only serving three and a half months. Funny how the burglary charge seemed more important than the attempted sexual assault of a minor or being a suspect in a violent murder. But it's true. For reasons unknown, Wallace was never arrested for failing to attend court for the attack on Viola. And even though Viola and her mom told authorities they wanted Wallace to be in jail, he was never brought to trial. It seemed as if they just forgot they had charges pending against him. It's truly baffling. I am not sure I have ever covered a case where authorities just forgot to prosecute a violent offender. Anyway, after being paroled for the larceny charges, Wallace went to live with his sister in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Then in late 1991, he moved 45 minutes away to Charlotte, North Carolina. His probation was transferred between the states. While in Charlotte, Wallace moved frequently and switched jobs often. He worked at Taco Bell, Golden Corral, Captain D's, and more. All locations were within walking distance of his apartment. At some point, Wallace met a woman named Sadie, and they started dating. She worked at Bojangles, which was right around the corner from Taco Bell where he worked. Remember, murder victim Susie Bochum worked at Bojangles as well. Moving on, Henry Wallace could not stay out of trouble, and not just petty crimes. In February 1992, he was charged with criminal sexual misconduct after he kidnapped and raped a 17-year-old female acquaintance, a girl named Kelly and Rock Hill. Kelly told investigators that she had met Wallace a year or so earlier. He was an acquaintance of a friend of hers. On the night of the attack, Wallace offered Kelly a ride, and she accepted. Instead of dropping her off where she told him to, he kept driving. That's when Kelly knew something was wrong. She went to jump out of the car, and Wallace told her, don't even think about it. Then he pulled out a gun and threatened to kill Kelly. He drove to a dead-end street in a wooded neighborhood and parked the car. There, he raped the 17-year-old. Afterwards, Wallace told her to drive. She headed toward her friend's house. Once they got to the house, she wrote down his license plate number and called the police. He was arrested four days later. As usual, Henry Wallace didn't stay in jail for long. He was released the same day on his own recognizance. Yes, an alleged rapist was let out of jail without even posting bond. When Kelly found this out, she was terrified for her life. She had heard Wallace was out looking for her. He told people he was going to kill her. Kelly left her young son with his father's mother and then fled the area. Thankfully, Wallace did not go after her. And he was never taken to trial for the kidnapping or rape charges because, again, authorities let him fall through the cracks. This is two times now that Henry Wallace literally walked away from sexual assault charges, even if one of them was attempted. They were both victims under the age of 18, and they were way more serious offenses than the next charges he caught. On February 4th, 1994, Wallace was arrested on charges of shoplifting at Eastland Mall. 
Even though he had warrants out for his arrest, he was released with a written promise to appear in court a month later. When Wallace missed the court date, a warrant was issued for his arrest. However, he was never taken to jail. After getting the name of 38-year-old Henry Wallace from Brandy Henderson's boyfriend, police found out that the same name was mentioned in Vanessa Mack's case and Susie Bocum's. Brandy's boyfriend was asked to name any men that she might have trusted to let into the apartment. Henry Wallace was on the list. Charlotte police were sure he was responsible for the murders of Vanessa Mack, Brandy Henderson, and Susie Bocum, but they needed more solid evidence. Luckily, that came for them on March 11th when Susie's car was discovered in a shopping center across the street from her apartment. Immediately, they noticed that the driver's seat, normally pushed forward for the 5-foot, 2-inch tall Susie, was pushed way back. Wallace missed that detail, even though he had managed to completely wipe the inside of the car clean of his prints. However, investigators were able to lift a palm print from the car and it was matched to Henry Wallace. That evening, investigators looked for Wallace, but they couldn't find him. They got a tip the next day and were able to track him down. They found him hiding in a friend's apartment. But they were too late. In the time it took to track him down, Wallace had killed another woman, 35-year-old Deborah Ann Slaughter. Born on January 15, 1959, in Vero Beach, Florida, Deborah was known for having an infectious laugh and a beautiful singing voice. She had one son and a grandson. In the spring of 94, Deborah lived alone in a Charlotte apartment. Henry Wallace had once lived in the same complex. Deborah worked as a Harris Teeter deli clerk. She had previously worked at the same Bojangles location as Wallace's girlfriend Sadie and his victim, Susie Bocum. On March 12, 1994, Deborah's mother went to her apartment. When she got no response from knocking on the door, she put her key in the door, but found that the door was unlocked. She walked inside and found Deborah's body lying face up on the floor. Police arrived and took note of everything at the crime scene. Deborah's purse contents were scattered on the floor. There was a balled up sock in Deborah's mouth, a towel around her neck, and 38 stab wounds, including three to the heart, 12 to the left lung, and several to the liver and stomach. Deborah also had several blunt force trauma injuries, including abrasions of the skin of her face and a scalp contusion. Her cause of death was multiple stab wounds and strangulation. After he was tracked down at a friend's house, Wallace was taken to the station for questioning. An investigator asked Wallace if he was involved in the murders of Susie Bocum and Deborah Slaughter. He said he knew both women, but was not involved in their deaths. The investigator wasn't falling for it. He told Wallace they found a palm print on Susie's car, and it was a match to him. He did not respond, but got emotional when he was shown a prior arrest photo of himself. The investigator and Wallace then discussed his drug addiction and his relationship with Sadie. But still, Wallace wasn't talking about the murders. Hours later, a different investigator entered the room. They talked about Wallace's drug addiction and Sadie, and then they prayed together. After the prayer, Wallace gave a sigh of relief, as the investigator put it, and wrote down the names of nine victims, five more than the investigators knew about. Wallace said there was a 10th victim, but he didn't know her name because she was a sex worker he had only met once. Back in May of 1992, Wallace had hired the woman for her services, as he put it. When she requested payment, he beat her to death and then left her body on the side of Roselle's Ferry Road. She wasn't found until a few days later on May 27th. Investigators were able to figure out who the victim was based on Wallace's statement. 32-year-old Sharon Lavette Nance. Born on November 19, 1959, Sharon's family described her as a sweet woman who drew and wrote poetry. She loved her son and would do anything for anyone. She lived with her aunt, and she was known to party a bit and run the streets. 
it's unclear if her family knew she was a sex worker, and it doesn't seem she did it all of the time. She wasn't a usual that the vice cops knew of. Sharon's family spent two years not knowing why she was murdered or who murdered her, and because Sharon was beaten to death, investigators never linked her murder to Vanessa, Brandy's, and Susie's. She was older than the other women and did technically live a riskier lifestyle, so how could she be connected to the other innocent young women being murdered? But she was. They just never knew it. In fact, Sharon's boyfriend had been the prime suspect in her murder. He even had a motive. Sharon was supposed to testify against him in a federal drug case. Wallace hadn't even been on their radar for Sharon's murder. Now, Henry Lewis Wallace kept on confessing. The floodgates had opened. The second victim he talked about was 20-year-old Caroline Love. Investigators knew the name. She had been reported missing in June of 1992 and was never found, though she was presumed dead. Born on July 17, 1971, Caroline loved listening to rap music and going to the hair salon. She would spend four or five hours getting her hair done, and you'd never know what to expect. In June 1992, Caroline was studying nursing at Central Piedmont Community College, the second victim attending that school. She was also roommates with Wallace's girlfriend, Sadie. They also worked together at Bojangles. Caroline's manager told the Charlotte Observer, She did her job and never gave me any problems. She rarely complained. On June 13th, Caroline worked the late shift at Bojangles. Yes, the same Bojangles as victims Susie, Deborah, and Wallace's girlfriend Sadie. Although she did go missing two years before the other murders, you would still think that police might have connected the women. But as they will say exhaustively later, they were way too understaffed. Again, Caroline was a young college student, not, in their minds, a drug addict running the streets. How did her name not come to mind when the other victims from Bojangles were discovered? Back to June 13th, when her shift was over, Caroline asked the night manager on duty if she could buy a roll of quarters for her laundry. The manager gave her the quarters in exchange for a $10 bill, and Caroline left the restaurant. She started walking to the apartment she shared with Sadie, which was six blocks away. On the way, Caroline saw her cousin Robert, and he gave her a ride home. Caroline got out of the car at her apartment, and Robert watched her walk inside. She was never seen alive again. A few days later, Caroline's manager contacted her sister Kathy, who also worked at Bojangles, to report that Caroline had not been at work for two days. Kathy had taken a small three-day vacation, so she had no idea Caroline had not shown up for work or that she was missing. Kathy went to Caroline's apartment, but didn't find her, so she left a note. The next day, Kathy was told that Caroline had still not been at work. Officially worried, she contacted Henry Wallace so she could get in touch with Sadie. All three of them went to the police station to file a missing persons report. Kathy told officers that it was very unlike Caroline to not contact them. Plus, she had a paycheck still waiting at work. That's right. Henry Wallace walked into the police station to report his own murder victim as missing. When asked if they knew anyone who wanted to hurt Caroline, Kathy said Caroline had received death threats from an uncle a man named Juan, after she refused to date him. Investigators looked through Caroline's apartment and noticed that the roll of quarters she had bought from her boss was not there. Later, Kathy went back to Caroline's apartment and noticed that furniture had been moved around some and some of the sheets from Caroline's bed were missing. Caroline Love's disappearance wasn't solved until Henry Wallace gave the confession. She was never linked to the murders because police said no one knew for sure she was dead. She was just officially a missing person. Wallace told investigators that at some point before June 13th, he had made a copy of Sadie's key, which he then used to get into the apartment while it was empty. When Caroline came home, Wallace told her he was in the bathroom and would leave when he was done. But that was a lie. Instead, 
He came out and walked into the living room where Caroline was watching TV and kissed her on the cheek. She told him she wouldn't tell Sadie as long as it didn't happen again. Wallace then put Caroline into a chokehold while she scratched his arm and face in an attempt to get away. She eventually passed out. Wallace said he took Caroline into her bedroom, took off her clothes, tied her hands behind her back with a cord of a curling iron, and covered her mouth with tape. Then he raped her while she was semi-conscious. During the rape, Wallace continuously choked Caroline until she went limp, but was still breathing. When he was finished, he strangled her to death. Wallace then left the apartment and moved his car closer to the stairwell before returning to the apartment with a large orange trash bag. He wrapped Caroline's body in a bed sheet, put it in the trash bag, and put the bag in the back seat of his car. He took the quarters from her dresser. Wallace drove around Charlotte to find a place to abandon Caroline's body. He finally settled on the woods. The next day, he returned to the location and removed Caroline's body from the bag because he worried it was too visible. Then he put her body in a shallow ravine. He was probably right. Someone may have seen the orange trash bag, but it's not like the Charlotte police were combing the woods for the missing 20-year-old girl, so no one came across her body in that ravine. Investigators knew of the next victim he mentioned, 20-year-old Shauna Denise Hawk. However, they had not connected her death to the other murders. Born on December 2, 1972, Shauna was described by her mother as being a low-maintenance child. She did what she was supposed to do when she was supposed to do it. When she was 14 years old, Shauna decided she wanted to start working to help pay her family's bills. She lied about her age to get a job at McDonald's, and for the next six years, she maintained a part-time job. In February 1993, Shauna and her mother, Dee, lived together in Charlotte. Shauna was a paralegal student at Central Piedmont Community College, our third victim who was a student at the same school. She worked at Taco Bell, where Henry Wallace was her manager. She was known to be reliable, kind, and well-liked. Shauna was engaged to be married. She did not have any children of her own, but she was very close to her godson. On February 19, 1993, Shauna took her godson to daycare and then went to class. When Dee got home from work, she didn't see Shauna's car in the driveway, so she figured Shauna was out running errands. Dee unlocked the front door, went inside, and decided to start making dinner. But first, she needed to go to the grocery store, so she went into Shauna's room to find a pair of shoes. That's when she noticed Shauna's coat in the closet. This stood out to Dee because it was a cold day out and she had seen Shauna wearing her coat earlier in the day. And then Dee saw Shauna's empty wallet. It was another surprising find, since Dee knew for a fact Shauna had cash. Dee felt something wasn't right. She started panicking, and she called Shauna's fiancé, Daryl, to ask if he had seen her, and he hadn't. Daryl drove to their home, and together he and Dee desperately looked for a note Shauna may have left to explain her disappearance. Daryl walked through the house and looked in each room. In a downstairs bathroom, he noticed that the shower curtain was outside of the bathtub. When he pulled it back, he found Shauna curled up and submerged in water. Shauna's mother heard Daryl scream. Then he came out and told her to call 911. Emergency services were called to the house. First responders tried to revive Shauna, but she was transported to the hospital and pronounced dead almost immediately. Her autopsy revealed a contusion on the left side of her scalp and a laceration on the left eardrum with some hemorrhaging behind the eardrum. This pointed to blunt force trauma prior to her death, but did not cause unconsciousness. There were also hemorrhages in the lining of her eyes, on the skin of her face, in the lining of her mouth, and in the muscles in the front of her neck. It's not unusual to see these hemorrhages in the eyes of strangling victims, but being visible on the skin of her face and neck pointed to an extremely violent strangulation. As one detective later noted, the killer could have let her catch her breath and then resume strangling her 
as part of his vicious gratification. However, the autopsy did not show signs of rape, but that evidence could have been washed away in the bathtub. Cops knew there had been no forced entry. It was someone Shauna let in. Daryl was their first, most obvious suspect. Strangulation murders usually point to a domestic violence situation, especially since at the time, the police did not believe Shauna had been sexually assaulted. Dee would later begin a support group for the mothers of murdered children. She wanted them to have the support she did not feel she had gotten when her daughter was murdered and the case went cold. During his confession, Wallace claimed he had had no intention of killing Shauna. He stopped by just to talk to her. After around an hour, Wallace took Shauna into her bedroom and told her to remove her clothes and perform oral sex on him, both of which she did unwillingly. And then Wallace raped Shauna. Afterwards, Wallace told Shauna to put her clothes on, and he took her into the bathroom. There, he put her in a chokehold until she passed out. He filled the tub with water and put an unconscious Shauna inside. Before leaving, he took $50 from her purse. Investigators were aware of the next victim Wallace confessed to murdering, 24-year-old Audrey Ann Spain. They had four suspects in that case, none of whom were Henry Wallace. Born on August 18, 1968, Audrey was the youngest of six children. She was known for being very friendly. She knew no strangers. A co-worker said, she always liked to make you smile and laugh. Audrey grew up in the tiny coastal town of Bayboro, South Carolina. In 1991, she moved to Charlotte in hopes of finding a job working with computers. She wasn't able to find her dream job right away, so she started working at Taco Bell. There she met Henry Wallace. They also lived in the same apartment complex at one point. On June 23, 1993, Audrey failed to show up for her 6.30 p.m. shift at Taco Bell. Her manager, Mark, thought this was strange, so he drove by her apartment later that evening. He saw her car in the parking lot and called and left a message on her answering machine for her, but he never got a reply. The next morning, Mark drove by again. Audrey's car was still in the parking lot. When she still failed to show up for her shift later that day, Mark called 911. That would be on June 24th, and police went to Audrey's apartment throughout the day and knocked on her door, but got no response. I guess they didn't think to call a maintenance worker to let them in or try to break down the door if they thought there was really a problem. Who knows at this point? On June 25th, the next day, a maintenance worker entered Audrey's apartment and found her dead on the bed. She had hemorrhages on the lining of her eyes, on the skin of her face, in the voice box, and in the muscles in the front of her neck, much like those found on Shauna's face and neck. She had minor blunt force injuries, such as a small facial abrasion, a small abrasion on the back and knee, and a small contusion on her right hip. Her cause of death was strangulation. Wallace told investigators that he went to Audrey's home on June 23rd under the guise of wanting to smoke a joint with her. His real motive for the visit was robbery. Once inside, Wallace put Audrey in a chokehold and asked what the combination was for the safe at Taco Bell, but Audrey said she didn't know what it was. Wallace also inquired about the money in Audrey's bank account, but she said she didn't have any money. Wallace maintained the chokehold until she passed out, and then he took Audrey into her bedroom and raped her. When he was finished, he brought Audrey into the bathroom and put her in the shower to wash evidence off of her. He then put her on the bed and tied a t-shirt and bra around her neck. The end of the t-shirt was stuffed in her mouth. Before he left the apartment, Wallace stole Audrey's keys and Visa credit card, which he used to buy gas. He later returned to the apartment and made calls on her phone so that it would look like she died on a different day. The next confession from Wallace came as a surprise. 21-year-old Valencia Michelle Jumper's death had been ruled as an accident, not a murder. Born on May 10, 1972, Valencia was the youngest of five. 
She was described as being an energetic person who was well-loved by everyone. A neighbor and friend told the Charlotte Observer, she was just one of those people who would do anything for you. If you asked her for something, she would give it to you. After graduating from Columbia High School, Valencia attended Winthrop University in Rock Hill. There, she became good friends with Henry Wallace's sister. In the summer of 1993, Valencia was about to start her final year at Johnson C. Smith University in Charlotte. She was a member of the National Association of University Women and the Archonettes of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority. Valencia worked at the Food Lion Grocery Store and at Hex Department Store. One of her supervisors told the Charlotte Observer she was a hard worker with a great personality, just really friendly to everybody. On August 9, 1993, Valencia talked to a friend about meeting up later that night. When the friend went to Valencia's apartment that night, in the early morning hours of August 10th, he saw smoke coming from the apartment. Firefighters were called to the scene at 1.56 a.m. According to the Charlotte Observer, by the time firefighters arrived, all they could do was extinguish the flames and help evacuate neighbors. Firefighters found Valencia dead in her bedroom. She had burns all over her body. They noticed that a burner on the stove had been left on. They concluded that the fire had started from a pot left burning on the stove. No one else in the 10-unit building was hurt, but all of the apartments were damaged by smoke. An autopsy concluded that Valencia died from burns to her body. No soot was found in her airway or carbon monoxide in her blood. Regardless, local newspapers reported that Valencia died after she fell asleep and left some beans cooking on the stove, which would seem to indicate smoke inhalation, not death from the actual burns. Valencia's family did not believe she would fail to turn the stove off before falling asleep. She was raised to always make sure the stove was off, and her door was locked before going to bed. They were right. They just didn't know it until after Henry Wallace confessed. Wallace told investigators, She was like a little sister to me. I don't know why I ever hurt her. On the night of August 9th, he went to Valencia's apartment and said he needed to talk about an argument he and Sadie had. They talked for a while, and then he left. Later, Wallace went back to Valencia's and asked her to call Sadie. When Valencia reached for the phone, Wallace put her in a chokehold and told her to go to the bedroom. He raped her and then told her to get dressed. While she put her clothes on, he choked her with a towel until she died. Wallace wiped his fingerprints from the apartment and took jewelry from Valencia's body and later sold it at a pawn shop. While in the kitchen, Wallace noticed a bottle of rum which he poured on Valencia's body, the bed, and the floor. He went into the kitchen, put a pot of beans on the stove on high, and took the battery out of the smoke detector. He then lit a match and threw it on Valencia's body and left the apartment. He also returned to the apartment 20 minutes later to make sure the apartment had caught fire. When he saw smoke coming from under the door, he went home. That is a lot more than you will usually see a murderer do to cover up their crime. It's diabolical. Who would think to start a pot of beans on high? then removed the batteries from a smoke detector, all to fool the firefighters. The sad thing is, it worked. Despite the medical examiner's report that she did not die of smoke inhalation, which, if her door had been shut, would have been the more likely cause, investigators did not look further into her death, even though her family didn't believe it could have happened that way. After Wallace's confession, the medical examiner re-examined Valencia's autopsy and changed the cause of death to strangulation. Investigators had been aware of the next murder, but did not know it was connected to the others. Michelle Denise Stinson was born on August 29, 1973. Family members described her as disciplined, well-organized, and a dedicated mother. In the fall of 93, Michelle was a graphic arts student at Central Piedmont Community College. I believe this is now our third student from the college who was murdered. Her teachers admired how she was able to make A's and B's in her classes, 
while raising two children as a single mother. And she was friends with Henry Wallace. On September 15, 1993, Michelle's friend James visited her apartment, but no one answered the door. James heard Michelle's sons knocking on the window, and they told him that Michelle was sleeping on the kitchen floor. James turned to leave when the oldest son went out the back door and grabbed him. James picked up the boy and went into the apartment through the back door. Inside, the TV was blaring. He walked around and found Michelle lying on the kitchen floor with blood surrounding her. He picked up the phone, but the cord was unattached from the wall. James took the children to a neighbor's and called the police. Investigators looked over the crime scene and found no sign of forced entry or of a struggle, which led investigators to believe Michelle knew the killer. Investigators spoke with the oldest son. He witnessed his mother's murder and was able to describe the assailant. An autopsy concluded that Michelle's cause of death was stab wounds to the chest and strangulation. Wallace told investigators that he went to Michelle's apartment at around 11 p.m. on September 14th. He went there with the intent to rape and murder her, a single mother of two, knowing her children would be there. Wallace and Michelle talked for a while. When he went to leave, they hugged. Wallace then told Michelle he wanted to have sex with her and told her to take off her clothes. Michelle said that she was sick, but Wallace said he didn't believe her and started to choke her. Michelle agreed to have sex with Wallace and took off her clothes. He raped her on the kitchen floor. Wallace put Michelle in a chokehold until she passed out and strangled her with a towel from the bathroom. Michelle was still alive and gasping for air, so Wallace stabbed her four times with a knife. He then used a washcloth to wipe his fingerprints from the glass, the door, the phone, the wall, and the floor. This is about the only latitude I will give the police. In many of the murders, Wallace did, in fact, go to great extremes to wipe away his prints and cover his tracks. Valencia Jumper's murder, covered by starting the fire, is the most extreme example. But I also want to point out that three murders of college students from the same school would and should have not only caught the cops' attention, but made front-page news. I come from a college town, and while it's not as big as Charlotte, murders of local students are a very big deal. I cannot believe how no one ever noticed this. Investigators knew about the rest of the murders Wallace confessed to. He told investigators that he was introduced to Vanessa Mack in July of 1993. Her sister worked with him at Taco Bell. On the night of February 19, 1994, Wallace was in Vanessa's neighborhood, so he called to see if she was home. When she picked up, he hung up the phone and walked to her apartment. He knew Vanessa had a job and money in the bank. He wanted to rob her so he could use the money to buy drugs. While at the apartment, Wallace tried to give Vanessa a hug so he could get her into a chokehold, but she refused. He then asked for something to drink, and when Vanessa turned her back, He took a pillowcase that he had brought with him and put it around her neck. He continued to put pressure on Vanessa's neck until she resisted. Wallace took Vanessa into the bedroom and demanded that she give him all the money she had as well as her ATM card and PIN number. She complied, and he told her to remove her clothes, which she did. He raped her, and then he had her put her clothes back on. Wallace choked her with a pillowcase until she passed out. He added another item of clothing to Vanessa's neck to make sure the pillowcase didn't get loose. Incredibly, Wallace said he checked on Vanessa's baby and stayed until the baby went to sleep on the couch. He later tried to use Vanessa's ATM card at several banks, but found that Vanessa had given him an incorrect PIN number. Police would later say that the grainy photo from the ATM popped into a detective's mind Once they had Wallace's name and mugshot, he wore a distinctive gold earring with a cross dangling on his left ear. A few weeks later, Wallace decided to rob and kill Susie Bogum. Since she was one of the supervisors at Bojangles, 
Wallace thought she would know the burglar alarm code and possessed keys to the safe, or knew the code to the safe. Wallace went to Susie's apartment and told her he needed to use the phone. She knew him, so she led him into the apartment, and they talked for a while. Wallace put Susie into a chokehold as he was leaving, and she fell to the floor. He told her he was robbing her and demanded the alarm code, keys, and the combination to the safe for the Bojangles. After 30 minutes, Susie was able to get the safe combination, and Wallace released her from the chokehold. Susie asked him, Why did you do that to me? To which Wallace responded that he was a sick person who had hurt a lot of people. Susie Bochum responded by hugging him, forgiving him, and telling him that he needed help. This made Henry Wallace mad, and he grabbed her by the throat and slammed her to the floor and scuffled with her, as he put it. Wallace then took Susie into the bedroom and told her to take off her clothes. When Wallace tried to rape Susie orally, she grabbed and scratched his penis, and they got into another scuffle. Susie bit Wallace on the shoulder and scratched his stomach. Wallace put a towel around Susie's neck and tightened it until she was nearly unconscious. He removed her clothes and raped her. After he told her to put her clothes back on, Wallace put the towel around Susie's neck again and asked for her money. Susie gave him the money from her purse and the gold chain from around her neck, but Wallace still strangled her to death. Wallace took Susie's TV and drove off in her car. He sold the TV for drugs and returned to the apartment to make sure that Susie was dead. He then took her VCR and used a wet cloth to wipe off the phone doorknobs and the wall. Wallace then went to Brandy Henderson's apartment, which was in the same complex as Susie's. Wallace was friends with her boyfriend, Vernus. He knew Vernus would be at work in the evening. Brandy and Wallace talked for a while, and he asked her for something to drink. When Brandy reached into the cabinet, Wallace choked her and told her to go into the bedroom. Brandy begged Wallace to let her hold her son, Tommy. Wallace replied, I don't know if that would be a good idea for what we're about to do. Wallace then demanded money from Brandy, and she gave him a Pringles can that had $20 worth of change in it and said there was no other money in the house. Wallace told her that he was going to take the TV and stereo with him when he left. He then raped Brandy and told her to put her clothes back on. He went into the bathroom, got a towel, and wiped things off. He then folded the towel and strangled Brandy to death. Then he put her body on her son Tommy's bed and then tied the towel around her neck. At this point, Tommy began to cry and Wallace gave him a pacifier. He then put another towel around the baby's neck and tied it tight so it would be difficult for Tommy to breathe so he would stop crying. Wallace disconnected Brandy's stereo and TV and put them in Susie Bochum's car, along with Susie's necklace and VCR. He sold all the items, then used the money to buy drugs. Wallace later left Susie's car in the parking lot across the street from her apartment. He wiped the interior and the exterior of the car down, but he forgot to wipe down the trunk lid. And I need to point out here that he is clearly escalating. Police had connected these two murders because they were in the same complex and so close together, but for some reason did not think to check local pawn shops for all the missing TVs, stereo, and jewelry. Come on, that's like Cop 101 if you've got a lead that they stole items from the victims. Wallace didn't know that investigators began looking for him after finding the car on March 11th. They never broadcasted or published a picture of Wallace to the public. Instead, they waited for the warrants to come through. During that time, Wallace killed his final victim, Deborah Slaughter. Before he was arrested on March 12th, Wallace went to Deborah's apartment to see if she wanted to go buy some drugs with him. She said she didn't have any money, so Wallace asked her to get something for him to drink. While her back was turned, Wallace put a towel around her neck and Deborah fell to her knees. Deborah then told Wallace she knew he was the person who killed the two other girls in the nearby apartments. Wallace told Deborah to remove her clothes and give him oral sex. Deborah responded by saying 
I don't do that. You might as well go ahead and kill me. Wallace tightened the towel around her neck and asked if she was sure. Deborah said yes, that she would not give him oral sex. Wallace then raped Deborah. When he was finished, he told Deborah to put her clothes on and to empty the contents of her purse. Wallace knew that she carried a knife in her purse, which he kicked away. He then told her to open her wallet and give him everything inside. She was still able to grab the knife while showing him the wallet. She hit Wallace and screamed. Wallace then tightened the towel around Deborah's neck. She fell to the floor and started kicking her legs, and Wallace tried to sit on them to prevent her from alerting any downstairs neighbors. After getting another towel from the bathroom and tying it around Deborah's neck, Wallace stabbed her with a knife. He then washed the knife and wiped his fingerprints from it. He left the apartment to buy drugs and then returned to smoke them in the bathroom. Before he left, he took a coat, baseball hat, and butcher knife with him. He later threw the items away. Just when investigators thought Wallace was done confessing, he said he had information on a murder from his hometown, the murder of Sean Bathia from his hometown in South Carolina. Wallace said he had a crush on Sean, but she resisted his advances. In mid-March 1990, Sean went on a ride with Wallace. He drove her to a wooded area outside of town and demanded sex. When she refused, Wallace pulled out a gun. He raped Sean and then asked if she would tell anyone. At first, Sean said she would tell, but then she got scared and promised that she wouldn't. Wallace felt like he couldn't trust her to stay quiet, so he decided to kill her. Wallace choked Sean once, but she woke up, so he choked her again. And then he slashed her wrists and throat with a box cutter and threw her into the pond. She was still alive when she was thrown in. As with many serial killers, Wallace's first victim was from his hometown of Barnwell, South Carolina. If the murder of Sean Bathia in South Carolina had been solved, it might have saved the lives of at least 10 other women. Henry Lewis Wallace was questioned as the main suspect in Sean's case, but released for lack of evidence. If there was follow-up from investigators in Barnwell, we didn't find it. Following his confessions, Wallace led investigators to the body of Caroline Love and pointed out where he had dumped the body of Sharon Nance, though she had already been found. Investigators asked Wallace why he killed the 11 women. He responded, There is no way I can say why I did what I did, because I really don't know. When asked if he got any satisfaction, Wallace responded no. It was like an out-of-body experience, more or less. It was like I didn't want to, but something or somebody was taking over my body, and I couldn't stop, even when I tried to stop even when I knew I really needed to stop. On March 13, 1994, the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department announced that they had arrested a serial killer. Many people were shocked to find out that the killer was Henry Wallace. A longtime classmate told the state that the Wallace she knew was friendly, cheerful, bright, and exceptionally well-mannered. One woman said, I would have trusted him with my daughter anywhere. Wallace's former radio station boss described him as the boy next door. He was nice and polite. However, that boss knew that Wallace wasn't the greatest guy. Remember, Henry Wallace had been fired after tapes and other equipment went missing when he worked there. The former boss had a feeling that he could be charming, but was also a thief. He theorized that Wallace would gain confidence after it was clear he could convince someone he wasn't a bad person. The boss said, you could look him in the eye and you would say, yeah, I believe you. If they put him to a lie detector test, he would pass it. Wallace's arrest gained a lot of press attention in the area. The police department was heavily criticized by the press and family members for not arresting him sooner. They felt police should have put the pieces together sooner due to the similarity of the crimes, their proximity to each other, Wallace's connection to several of the victims, and his history of violent sex crimes. 
There were also a lot of questions about the justice system's handling of his cases. How was he able to stay out of jail even when he violated his parole? Why had he been let out of jail on his own recognizance after kidnapping and raping a teenager in 1992? At that point, he had already attacked another teenager, and he was the main suspect in Sean Bathia's murder. It is insane to me that he was released without even posting bond. It's insane that he was released at all, frankly. Why was Wallace able to get out of jail on February 4th, 1994, when he had a warrant out for his arrest? And why didn't authorities warn the public about Wallace while they waited for arrest warrants on March 11th and 12th? I know they were afraid he would run, but they still had a duty to warn the community about this violent offender who had managed to hide in plain sight for so long, especially since many in the community knew Henry Wallace. If they had, maybe Deborah would still be alive. Her sister told the Charlotte Observer, I definitely want some answers. If he was a suspect so long ago, why did it take this long to catch him? Why did my sister have to die? The News and Observer reported that the local NAACP leaders believed police took the killings less seriously because the victims were black. Leader Kelly Alexander said, The Charlotte Police Department dropped the ball. This was a big mistake that may have cost some lives, and it's the type of mistake that cannot be allowed to happen again. Authorities responded to all of these questions and claims. Interim Police Chief Jack Boger said, It is fair. I don't know if I like it, but it's fair. All the questions are legitimate. He believed investigators did a good job, but the department was reviewing everything for mistakes. He said, I wish we had figured it out sooner, but we didn't. It's like any puzzle. It's real clear when you get to the end, but it's not when you're putting it together. The puzzle comment sounds rational until you think of all the ties to Henry Wallace the victims had, to all the students from one school being murdered, from several employees from the same restaurant, I could go on and on, but I think I've made my point. Police explained that Wallace was a very clever criminal and took extensive measures to make sure he didn't get caught. I watched one documentary where the detectives said they had nine homicide detectives on anywhere from 80 to 100 murders in a year, of mostly black victims. They stressed it was during the crack epidemic. And they pointed out that while there were many strangulation murders, They did not all match exactly. I get that. I get departments being stretched thin. I think we see that all the time. One thing I also found confounding about this documentary is that the detectives kept saying there were no signs of rape. Anyone who watches Law & Order SVU or Criminal Minds could tell you these murders were sexually motivated. One detective did point out that they believed it was the strangulation itself that was sexual gratification. But later, Henry Wallace admitted to raping all of his victims. It's strange to me why the police did not characterize Henry Wallace as a sexual sadist murderer right away. He raped women. He tortured them while strangling them. Well, it turns out that Wallace thought that if he made his victims redress, they might not be tested for sexual assault. He was wrong. Rape kits were administered in at least five of the cases, and because of a massive backlog, none of these kits had been tested yet. Once they did, Wallace's DNA matched in all five cases. But he was also right. The detectives in these cases all had to admit that they did not know the women were raped. They thought these were just strangulation murders. Maybe I've covered true crime for too long and it's so obvious to me, but I do believe it should be obvious to any homicide investigator that a strangulation murder, which has been ruled out as a domestic violence case, is probably a sex crime. Why did they not follow up with the medical examiners who did the rape kits? If they had, they could have possibly rushed the DNA, but with the lackadaisical way it was described, As mired in a huge backlog, who knows? The police stuck to their story that the mistakes made were not due to the victims being black. The police said, this is not a black-white issue. 
most of the homicides we investigate involve black victims, and we have a very good record of solving them. They insisted Wallace was a clever serial killer. Along with being canny enough to ask his victims to redress, Wallace was meticulous in his earliest murders. He often cleaned up after himself, meaning he covered his tracks well. When he started getting messy is when the police finally started thinking they had a serial killer, and yet it did not occur to them to go back through old cold cases, especially when you've got such a high murder rate at the time. And maybe that is your answer. There were so many victims of violent crime in Charlotte, the detectives did not choose to review and compare old cases, even once they knew they had a serial killer. North Carolina probation authorities said they had warned South Carolina authorities about Wallace's parole violations, but that's all they could do. It was South Carolina's responsibility to do something about the violations. Of course, South Carolina authorities said they never received any parole violation reports. And when it came to the claims that the murders weren't solved because the victims were black, investigators continued to outright deny that was true. Families were furious, and the press definitely ran with their fury. Despite the extensive press coverage, Wallace's trial was not moved to a new venue. Jury selection began in September of 1996. The trial was for the murders of Caroline Love, Shauna Hawk, Audrey Spain, Valencia Jumper, Michelle Stinson, Vanessa Mack, Susie Bochum, Brandy Henderson, and Deborah Slaughter. They said that Sharon Nance and Sean Bethea's murders were not included as they were not in the same jurisdiction. But Sharon Nance was in Charlotte, North Carolina. It was Sean Bethea whose murder was in South Carolina. Moving on. The prosecution told the jury that Wallace was a cold-blooded serial killer. He planned all of his attacks in advance. The Charlotte Observer reported that defense attorneys acknowledged that Wallace committed the crimes, but they argued that mental illness and childhood trauma left him in psychological tatters. He was a victim of obsessive sexual fantasies that drove him to commit the murders. The defense said Wallace grew up in a cinder block shack without indoor plumbing. His mother beat him with extension cords, tennis rackets, and her hand. She would also make him dress like a girl so she could ridicule him. At around four years old, the defense said he was molested by older girls. Four years later, he witnessed a girl being gang raped. At a young age, he was exposed to pornography and magazines that depicted rape and sexual violence against women. If all of this is true, it is quite the common upbringing for a sexual sadist psychopath. Not only his own abuse, but witnessing such sexual violence. But, I say if, because the story does not jive with the high-achieving high school student we know Henry Wallace was, nor the blue-collar heroine his mother had been characterized as. Now he grew up in a shack without running water? It doesn't make sense. That's not to say poor kids cannot be high achievers. They certainly can. But he was also described as always being a well-dressed young man who participated in many extracurricular activities, which we all know can cost parents a lot of money. Again, it doesn't really jive with the story of Henry Wallace's life as we know it. I'm not sure other than professional trial psychologists who testified to this theory, but I'm just saying there are plenty of ways of becoming a psychopath. As I said in our last episode, academics argue over nature and nurture, with both usually being the common answer. It's definitely probable that Henry was exposed to some sort of sexual violence or faced some abuse, but this would be a common defense for a sexual sadist anyway. However, even if it was all true, That does not mean that Henry Wallace did not understand the difference between right and wrong, which we all know is the basis for a diminished capacity defense in this country. The fact that he was able to cover his tracks so well proves he understood what he did was wrong. The amount of planning removes all doubt about his mental competence. But of course, the defense said that Wallace suffered from a mental illness, which stemmed from his childhood and drug addiction 
and that meant he couldn't form the intent needed for first-degree murder. Wallace did not testify at the trial, which is not unusual and would not have helped him at all anyway. Honestly, like Haley said to me, it's strange he bothered to go to trial, except maybe he really thought he had a chance at diminished capacity. But if you've confessed to 11 rapes and murders, you're wasting your time. But we don't know for sure. Perhaps plea deals were off the table. Police in the DA's office definitely had egg on their faces with this case. I'm sure the public would have demanded a trial. One reporter named Glenn Counts pointed out in a documentary called Bad Henry that once Wallace was named and his face was everywhere and the outrage from the black community reached a fever pitch, all of the sudden, the sheriff made one of the detectives the lead detective, the face of the investigation, and he was a black man named Gary McFadden. McFadden oddly expressed frustration with all of the blame the families put on the police. He even seemed defensive. That's not something you usually see in these interviews. All of the detectives interviewed made it seem as though they understood the nature of the crimes at different points, but in reality, and towards the end of the documentary, you find out they didn't understand it at all. They didn't even know the women were raped until Henry Wallace told them so. This is a case of incompetence, and in the furious aftermath, well-deserved from the victims' families, the police promoted a black detective to be the face of the investigation. That is no accident, and the local Charlotte reporter Glenn Counts, who pointed it out, is also a black man. On January 7, 1997, a jury found Henry Lewis Wallace guilty of nine counts of first-degree murder on the basis of malice, premeditation, and deliberation. He was also found guilty of 19 other charges, including first-degree rape, assault on a child under the age of 12, and robbery with a dangerous weapon. On January 29th, Wallace's sentencing hearing was held. Normally, a murder defendant would not be allowed to address the court. However, because Wallace was sentenced to other crimes, he was allowed to. He read a three-page statement, which stated in part, What words in any language can I say that will bring you comfort, quiet from the storm, or release you from the mental prison I have put you in? I'm sorry. I apologize. I didn't mean to. I profess that all of these words and all that I know fall short of what's needed to console any of you. He went on to say, I know that it is hard to believe, but I suffer a great loss with each and every one of you. Wallace said, I want to say here and now, none of these women in any way deserved what they got. They did nothing to me that warranted their death. No shit, you monster. Then he read from the Gospel of Mark and asked the families to forgive him. Many family members were highly offended by his apology. Brandy's cousin shouted, Why did you kill them? Caroline's sister had to be restrained by deputies as she pushed towards Wallace, screaming out. They had every right to be angry. They should never have let him make that statement. Wallace was given nine death sentences for the nine first-degree murder convictions. For all of his other convictions, he was given 10 consecutive life sentences, plus 322 years. Wallace's convictions and death sentences were affirmed by the North Carolina Supreme Court. All subsequent appeals have been denied. Today, Wallace is being held on death row at Central Prison in Raleigh, North Carolina. According to the News and Observer, Wallace was never taken to trial over Sharon Nance's murder, because it didn't fit the pattern that linked him to the other murders. I told you that was not right and that she was in Charlotte. Unlike all the other victims, Wallace didn't know Sharon. If you remember, Sharon was also the only one of the victims who sometimes worked as a sex worker. Maybe they didn't think she was the right kind of victim to put in with the other ten young ladies. And that just breaks my heart. We couldn't find any updates on why Wallace did not go to trial over Sean Bethea's murder, but I think it's safe to assume prosecutors didn't feel the need to since he had already received nine death sentences. 
and Sean's murder was in South Carolina. I guess they figured North Carolina had nine death sentences, so why bother? Well, you bother to provide comfort to the victim's family in the form of justice. You bother on the chance that one of the killer's appeals will work, especially in death penalty cases where they are granted an automatic appeals process. You bother. You should bother. You should care enough to go through with a trial for her family. Sean was his first victim, a lovely young girl who never received justice, though her case will always be connected to Henry Wallace's name, a girl who knew Henry and thought he was harmless, right up until he raped and murdered her. 18-year-old Sean did promise Henry she wouldn't tell after he raped her. He made her promise, and then he killed her anyway in one of his most vicious attacks. He strangled her, slashed her wrists and throat with box cutter, and then threw her in a pond while she was still alive. That is the monstrosity of Henry Lewis Wallace. Typically, the sexual sadist, psychopathic murderer hunts women who are not near his home and cannot be linked back to him. Henry Wallace knew all of his victims. All of these women knew and trusted him. They opened their doors to him. Sean got in the car with him, even though her instincts had originally told her not to. As a society, we are programmed for stranger danger. I don't care what decade you grew up in, even though stranger danger is typically from my age group. We believe that these kinds of crimes do not happen to us from men we know. However, homicide detectives know that most victims know their killer. Usually, they are intimately involved. It's why the boyfriend or husband is the first suspect, but often it is also an acquaintance. In modern investigations, after the men closest to the victim are ruled out, they span out to all the other men the women are associated with. But this was the early 90s, and Charlotte, North Carolina, was woefully behind in every respect. Understaffed, no forensic lab, you name it, they had a problem. I never did hear the magic words of underfunded, though. That is usually an excuse in a case like this, where in hindsight, investigators should have connected the dots much, much sooner. If the Charlotte police had run those rape kits, they would have realized that they had a serial killer on their hands. But these guys didn't even bother to follow up with the M.E. to see if the victims had been raped. It is difficult for me to accept their excuses. Despite not having his DNA, they had found other ways to clear the boyfriends, thank God. But this DNA would not only have cleared the boyfriends in their lives, it would have linked the murders much quicker. If any good came from the horrific crimes of this case, it is that the Charlotte Police Department hired several more homicide detectives, they opened their own forensic unit, and they developed programs to work more sensitively with the victims' families. Those first two developments were natural after the Wallace case. The last one, Developing a program to work with the families is so important. Not just so investigators don't wind up in the crosshairs of the media and grieving families, but because it is the right thing to do. As a society, we are moving forward, understanding that we need to prioritize the way victims' families are treated. It's the very least we can do when we cannot give them answers. Southern Fried True Crime is hosted and produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched by Haley Gray, Anna Luria, and me. It was written by me and Haley Gray. Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio and the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. If you have any case suggestions, please go to my website and click on the listener suggestion tab. This is the best way for me to get those little known cases y'all always send me. Please remember that I do not accept suggestions on social media private messages with three platforms to manage. That is very overwhelming for me. I hope you understand. But please come join our Facebook group, Southern Fried True Crime Fans Discussion Group, where we swap recipes, 
worship Dolly Parton, and share memes. I much prefer spending my social media time in our lovely group. We do, of course, discuss true crime, not just Southern fraud, but all kinds. But it is still very much a Southern lifestyle group. Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God, we mean it when we say no shit ass is allowed. It's not just a motto, it's how we run the group. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on all large platforms like iHeart, Stitcher, Spotify, and now Amazon and Audible. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.